Welcome to this lecture in the 0006 series on pharmaceutical materials. My name's Simon, in case you don't remember me from last year's rheology lecture. Today we're going to talk about some of my favourite materials, crystalline materials and amorphous materials. I start every lecture with a cup of coffee and I highly recommend that you have a cup of tea or a cup of coffee too. So if you don't have one, press pause, and go make yourself one. When you've got one, come back, press play and let's make a start. So the way this is going to work is that there's a series of videos which are going to replace the lecture that I would ordinarily give by standing in front of you in the John Hanbury Lecture Theatre. I've split the lecture up into small chunks so you can watch each chunk at a time. You can play back, watch again, make sure you're happy with the material. At the end, you should be able to do the following things as written on the screen. You should be able to describe crystal structure and you should be able to describe habit. Crystal structure and crystal habit are two completely different things. So if nothing else, when you get to the end of the lecture, if you think they are the same thing, then you've gone wrong. So you need to go back and watch that again. Make sure you understand what the difference uh, is. You should be able to explain polymorphism and hydrate formation. Hydrates are a type of polymorph. But it's kind of important to understand what exactly a hydrate can do to a drug substance because you might be surprised some of the effects hydrate formation can have. You should be able to compare and contrast amorphous and crystalline systems. And we're going to start this lecture in just a moment with an example of crystalline and amorphous materials. I'm going to show you how different they are. And you should be able to explain you know, why, where the molecules are in those materials. What is it that makes those two types of material behave differently? And then finally, and possibly the most important, you should be able to um, discuss the effect and influence of those forms. So, uh, physical form is a term you might not have heard of, but physical form means crystalline or amorphous materials. You should be able to discuss the effect of the physical form on how you formulate materials and also how those materials behave as medicinal products. If you want to do some background reading, and I highly recommend that you do do some background reading, there are a number of textbooks that I would recommend. The first one is Alton's Pharmaceutics. No surprise really, it's the main textbook for all pharmaceutics uh, topics. So that's a very good basic textbook and I kind of hope you already have that one. The other one underneath it is written by a really, really tremendous author, Essentials of Pharmaceutical Preformulation. I know the author personally because the author is me. So I wrote that textbook uh, many years ago while I was on sabbatical and the idea is that um, I took some of the material that I teach in lectures and then condensed it so each um, lecture became a chapter in that book. So there's a series of chapters uh, in that book which I think you might find quite um, relevant to this lecture and other lectures not just this one actually. So I'm not just plugging my own book although I, I kind of am plugging my own book. There's loads of copies of it in the library so um, you'll, you'll find that there is an amorphous chapter and a crystalline materials chapter in that book. So have a look at that. It's, um, it's got the same examples in as I'm going to talk about uh, in the lecture. So it always surprises me. We are one of the world's top schools of pharmacy. And just being here as a student means you are one of the top students in the country. It never ceases to amaze me, therefore, when I ask students, what's the difference between a drug and a medicine? That can sometimes confuse them. <sighs> and the definition is quite clear. The drug substance is the active moiety that's doing something in the body. So that's the chemical species that's having an effect in the body. And the drug product is the formulated drug substance. OK, so most times when we make a drug product or a medicine, it doesn't just contain drug powder. It contains the drug mixed in with other ingredients or excipients for some reason. I don't know why we call them that. And that helps the final product do various things in the body. You're probably familiar with tablets and uh, capsules most often, but obviously they have things added to help them uh, dissolve, disperse, um, maybe to compact in the, in the um, case of a tablet. So the excipients are doing something usually. You don't normally add something to a product unnecessarily, but nonetheless, it's important to see that the drug product or the medicine that the consumer is getting from you in your pharmacy uh, contains the drug substance as well as some other stuff. So the, the medicine itself is a formulated drug substance. So on the screen, you can see a box of Nurofen, which would be the medicine that you might 
give to a patient and that contains the drug substance which is ibuprofen which is shown on the right. In order to make the most effective drug products we really need to understand the properties of the drug substances themselves. So on the screen same molecule ibuprofen on the right hand side I'm simply noting that some of the properties of a drug substance are inherent to the molecule okay so sometimes we might ask you questions where you look at the structure of a drug and we ask you what do you think is going to happen to this drug when you do something to it so if you look at ibuprofen on the screen you can see it's got um, a bit of a hydrocarbon tail on one side it's got a benzene ring in the center and then to the right hand side it's got a carboxylic acid group so for instance some of the properties that are inherent to the molecule would, would include solubility uh, and also because this is an acid it has the propensity to react with a base to form a salt so sometimes when you go and look at neurofen products for instance you'll see you can get salt forms of ibuprofen and the reason is because it's an acid so we can tell that just by looking at the chemical structure of the drug we don't need to know anything else about it and we don't need to do any experiments we can just look at the structure of that drug and we start to know something about how it's going to behave on the left hand side of the screen there are a series of drug molecules they're all ibuprofen i've just put lots of them together and what i want to get across here is that some of these properties that we might measure they are a function of the way that the molecules pack together okay so if i give you some good examples density would be one an obvious one about how the molecules are packing together but there are some other ones compressibility melting point a material can't melt unless it's uh, already in some sort of crystalline structure as we'll look at later so some of the properties of a molecule are inherent to the molecule and we call those chemical properties and some are inherent to the way that the molecules pack together and we call those physical properties so when we measure these properties sometimes we're measuring physical properties sometimes we're measuring chemical properties and so we put the words together and we call them physicochemical properties so you might have heard of that sometimes we do physicochemical characterization and that simply means we're measuring some properties of a particular material and they might be physical properties or chemical properties at the bottom of the slide in the pink boxes there are two words particles and molecules it never ceases to amaze me how frequently students use those two words interchangeably but they do not mean the same thing so just to be clear and I apologize if this is a little bit basic at the start but I'm gonna say it anyway molecule means the individual drug substance one example of the individual drug substance is shown on the screen on the right particles mean um, a macroscopic co collection of molecules into something that you can actually see so you need to be able to see a particle so particles contain many molecules and a molecule is the individual component of the particle on the screen are two very common materials that you might have come across uh, on a daily basis I live in a house with a couple of teenagers and I can tell you that uh, these materials are consumed with quite frightening in quite frightening amounts on a daily basis maybe not the candy floss but certainly the sugar cubes we certainly seem to get through a lot of sugar cubes so you probably recognize these materials uh, once one because it's written on the, the bag candy floss on the right sugar cubes are on the left why am I starting a lecture on crystalline materials and amorphous materials with something that you might find in the kitchen I hear you ask well, the answer is it's a good way for me to explain the difference between crystalline and amorphous materials so if I start with sugar cubes I think you might imagine if you look at those sugar cubes they look cubic that's why they're called uh, cubes but they're really compressed um, collections of sugar particles the same way that a tablet is made and if we were to look at each one of those individual sugar particles we'd also see it as kind of cubic okay if I asked you what molecule is in the candy floss or sugar cubes I hope you'd say to me sucrose so the molecule is the same it's uh, sucrose on the left and it's sucrose on the right the only difference is the way that that sucrose has been processed to make sugar cubes it's been crystallized and to make candy floss uh, it's been made amorphous okay let's think about the properties of some of these things I'm going to start with sugar cubes so 
I like to uh, demonstrate visually as well as by talking. So it just so happens that I have some sugar cubes right here with me in uh, a little beaker. And also because I'm a child of the 70s, I've got this tremendously retro thermos flask, flask with some hot water. So if I said to you, let's say you made that cup of tea that I said you should make at the start of this lecture. And you are like a builder and you have several sugar cubes in your cup of tea. So you put the sugar cubes into your cup of tea. Do they dissolve instantly? And while you think about that, I'm just going to have a bit of my own drink. Very good. Hopefully, once you've had a chance to think about that, you're going to say to me, no, they don't. They do not dissolve instantly, which is surprising because sucrose has got a very high solubility in water. Why? Why don't they dissolve? Well, we're going to look at that in a minute. What do you have to do to make them dissolve? So let's imagine you've got your sugar cubes, you've got your hot water. Let's add the hot water. The sugar cubes are not dissolving very fast. Some of it has dissolved because the colour has changed, hasn't it? But not all the sugar has dissolved. And so in order to make it dissolve, we have to add some sort of mechanical energy. So let's do that. Stir. And then I hope you can see that the sugar is at least dissolving a bit more. Even then, even though I've stirred it, there's still sugar undissolved at the bottom of my beaker. OK. Have you ever asked yourself why that is? Why, why do I have to stir sugar in a beaker in order to get it to dissolve, even though sucrose has a relatively high solubility? And the answer is because sugar cubes, as I said already, they are a crystalline material. Crystalline means all of the molecules in those uh, crystals are aligned in a repeating pattern. So imagine each one of my fingers as a sucrose molecule in a crystalline structure. Each of those sucrose molecules is aligned in a perfectly repeating pattern. If I was to look with a really, really strong microscope at the structure of the sugar cube, I would see each of the sucrose molecules sitting in exactly the same position and the pattern is repeating. Now what that means is two sucrose molecules next to each other, they're in very close contact. So you can see there's a lot of points of contact between my two fingers. And so effectively they're interacting with each other. And in order to get the material to dissolve, we have to break this molecule and pull it away from the rest of the molecules in the crystal. So we have to break the energy or the bonds that are holding this sucrose molecule in the crystal structure in order to get it to dissolve in water. And that is a barrier to dissolution. If this is being held together because they're interacting, to break these bonds, we have to put energy in. So we have to add energy to break the molecules uh, apart in the crystal structure. Whenever we have to put energy into something, it's an endothermic process. And it's not very favourable, and so it takes quite a lot of time. So I've added hot water. See, it's nearly dissolved now. I did hot water, and the hot water contains a lot of energy. So when we add the sugar cubes to the hot water, there is some energy that's being supplied from the temperature of the water, but it's still not enough to break the molecules off quickly enough. And then when we stir, we're adding a mechanical energy as well. That helps to break the molecules apart and then they can dissolve. This has a number of consequences, not just for how quickly your uh, cup of tea becomes sweet. Imagine that I made a drug substance and it was in a tablet and the drug substance was in there as a crystalline particle. What would that mean? It would mean that as the patient swallows that tablet and that tablet starts to disintegrate in the stomach, for instance, it's going to release crystalline drug particles. There's no real difference between crystalline drug particles and crystalline sucrose particles. They're still going to dissolve relatively slowly. What we don't tell patients to do is to follow swallowing a tablet with taking really, really hot water, because that would be both dangerous and quite damaging, wouldn't it? And also, we don't tell patients to stir the contents of their stomach because they can't get a spoon down their neck. So unlike dissolving a sugar cube in uh, hot water for a cup of tea, you can't then stir um, a tablet that's been swallowed by someone. So what that means is the rate at which the drug is going to dissolve into solution inside the body 
we can't really change. It's a function of the crystal structure. And I want you to see that sometimes, because it's in a crystal structure, the dissolution rate can be quite low. What does that mean for the performance of the tablet itself? Let's say you've got a screaming headache and you want to take some Nurofen to get better. And that uh, ibuprofen in that Nurofen tablet is in a crystalline structure. It means that when you swallow it, it's going to take time for the ibuprofen molecules to dissolve into solution. And they're not going to be absorbed into the bloodstream until they've been dissolved into solution. And there's nothing you can do about it. You can't stir or, or drink hot water or anything like that. It's a natural uh, function of the fact it's a crystalline material. Crystalline material means you're going to get the slowest onset of action of your drug substance. Why, in that instance, are the majority of drug substances formulated as crystalline materials? Surely the pharmaceutical industry would want to make each tablet as fast acting as possible. And the answer is stability. A, a sugar cube is very stable on storage. You can leave sugar cubes in your cupboard in your kitchen and unless you have a house full of teenagers, they will stay there or builders, they will stay there for quite a long time. And the reason is because a crystalline uh, material is a very stable material. There's nowhere else that the molecules can really go. They're all arranged in this beautiful pattern. They're all held tightly next to each other. There's no other arrangement of molecules that they want to get to. They're happy in a crystalline arrangement. And so they're very stable. And you can leave a sugar cube in your kitchen cupboard for years and it will be fine. And the same is true for tablets. When you buy a tablet or a box of tablets and it's got a three year use by date on it, what that means is you need to come back in three years time, push one of those tablets through the blister pack. It should be the same as when it was made. And one way of ensuring that it is, is to put crystalline materials into the tablet because they're not going to change. There's nowhere for those tablets to go. OK, so the pharmaceutical industry is a very conservative industry. Overall, all else, it, con it concerns itself with safety. Safety is the number one factor in developing a medicine. So by making a crystalline version of your drug and using that in your tablet, you can ensure that the stability of your product is the greatest. But usually it means that the performance of your product is the lowest. If you remember nothing else from this lecture, just remember that, that most drug substances on the market, the way they're formulated, are really badly performing, but they're really stable. <laughs> so they're stable because they contain crystalline materials. Now on the screen in front of you, you can see candy floss. I don't know if you remember the last time you had candy floss. I'm a lot older than you are, and I haven't been to a circus for probably 30 years, but I can still remember the feeling of having candy floss when my parents took me to um, a circus. So have you ever had candy floss? Think about it, big, fluffy. What's that feeling when it goes near your mouth or into your mouth? What does it feel like when the candy floss goes into your mouth? Do you remember? Usually, if we were in the John Hanbury Lecture Theatre, I would ask you all, you know, what does it feel like, candy floss? Someone would say, it feels like it's melting, sir. And that's right, it feels like it melts. You put in a large volume of candy floss into your mouth, relatively instantly, it's all kind of disappeared, and you've got a small amount of sugar left on your tongue, and it feels like it has melted. As we're going to see later, amorphous materials can't melt. But the analogy is, kind of good and I, I kind of accept it. It feels like the candy floss melts in your mouth. So what actually happens is that the sugar, the sucrose in the candy floss is in an amorphous state. Amorphous, which we're going to look at a bit later on, means lack of form, no structure. So if each one of my fingers is a sucrose molecule, in a crystalline material they're arranged in the pattern, in an amorphous material there is no repeating pattern. So the molecules are randomly structured. They can be in any particular orientation, it doesn't matter. Hopefully, by looking at my fingers, you can see there's a difference between a crystalline structure and an amorphous structure. In a crystalline structure, the molecules are really tightly packed together and they're probably interacting with each other, maybe through hydrogen bonding or something like that. And so there's a lot of energy needed to break these molecules apart. In an amorphous structure, the molecules are not very well aligned, and so there's very little of each molecule 
t interacting with its nearest neighbour. And so there isn't really that requirement to add lots of energy to break the molecules apart and get them to dissolve. Nothing's really holding them in place in the first place. And so when you take an amorphous material and you add it to water, instantly the material um, dissolves because there's very little energy needs to be put in to break those molecules apart. Now, let's think again about pharmaceutical materials. What would it mean if I were to formulate a drug in a medicine as an amorphous material rather than a crystalline material? It would mean that when the patient swallows that medicine, instantly the, 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 um, the drug is going to disperse and dissolve and so it's going to go into solution very quickly. And so you're going to get a very rapid onset of action. And that is true if you make a drug substance in an amorphous form and you measure the bioavailability in humans, what you'll find is that the bioavailability is a lot faster because it's getting into solution a lot more quickly. Why? Why then are most, not all, but most drug substances on the market not amorphous? There are some amorphous forms and we're going to talk about that later, but in the main, most medicines on the market are crystalline. Why do you think there are not so many amorphous materials on the market? How to think? The answer is stability. It's the same answer as the previous question. Imagine I got you some candy floss at the fair, because I'm kind of nice like that. So imagine I bought you some candy floss and you didn't want to eat it all straight away. Maybe you're worried about the risk of diabetes or something like that. So you put it into a kitchen cupboard and you leave it, forget about it, and you come back to it in three years' time. Do you think that the candy floss is going to look like that in the, on the picture in three years' time? I think the answer is no, <laughs> and the chances are it's going to have absorbed some sort of water from the surroundings over that three-year period, uh, and it's essentially going to have melted um, while it's on storage. Uh, what, what's actually happened is that it will absorb water that water will help the molecules to move and it will recrystallize. And so it will go from an amorphous material to a crystalline material on storage. When you go back to your kitchen cupboard and you remembered the candy floss after three years and you think you want to eat it, what you'll actually find is a, sm a small number of sucrose crystals at the bottom of the bag because the material has crystallized um, down. So one, you'll be disappointed, but two, if you then put that in your mouth, it won't dissolve very fast because now the material is crystalline and it goes back to the slow dissolution of crystalline materials. So I said already, the pharmaceutical industry is hugely conservative and it cares above all else about the stability of its products. And so it only makes amorphous products if it really, really has to. If it can get away with a crystalline material, then it will always go with a crystalline material because of the stability issue. But nonetheless, I at least wanted to start this lecture with a, a simple molecule that you're familiar with, sucrose. And I want you to see that the only difference between candy floss and sugar cubes is the way the molecules are arranged. If we were to look at the chemistry of, sugar, um, of a candy floss and sugar cubes, we will see it's the same. Because the chemistry is about the sucrose and the sucrose is the same. The only difference between candy floss and sugar cubes is how the sucrose molecules are aligned together okay and so that's what we call physical form the physical form of sucrose in sugar cubes is different from the physical form in candy floss and it has this huge impact on how the material behaves for real we need some way to define where the molecules are in crystalline materials and note here that i'm not saying amorphous materials and that's because amorphous means lack of form so there's no real way of defining where the molecules are in an amorphous material, as we shall see later. But for crystalline materials, it is important that we are able to define where all the molecules are. Now, if you think about the sugar cube that we looked at before, we could take one crystal of sucrose from that sugar cube and we could try and define where each of the molecules of sucrose is in that crystal. And in that way, we could then define the crystal structure. The reason we don't do that is because there are trillions and trillions and trillions of molecules, even in the smallest crystal. And so to try and write down the position of each molecule, it would be crazy because it would take too long. So what we do instead is we define a special thing called a unit cell. The unit cell is really important. It's really important to understand because it defines crystalline materials. And if you're not... Um, 
really understanding the concept of a unit cell, you're going to find it really difficult later on to understand why different crystalline materials behave in different ways. So I'm going to take a few minutes to explain what a unit cell is. And if you don't understand it, stop the video, watch it again, maybe go and uh, look at a textbook. If you're still not clear, send me an email and I'll do my best to try and find a form of words to help you understand it. Because it's really critical that you understand what a unit cell is in order to go forward with the lecture. So if you look at the screen, on the bottom of the screen, you can see a green cube. So what we normally do is we try and say where the molecules are in three dimensional space and we try and put them into a cube and that cube becomes a unit cell. Another way of thinking about this is that the mm -hmm. unit cell is the smallest um, pattern of molecules that we need to define, which then repeats in three dimensions to build up a big crystal. So earlier I was saying, imagine that my fingers were individual sucrose molecules. So imagine that my crystalline structure had sucrose molecules put together like this. If I add more sucrose molecules, I get this, then this, and so on. And my fingers would go in this direction, this direction, and this direction, and it would build up the crystal structure. I only need to define these two, the position of these two fingers, because once I've done that, every other finger that I add is also in this pattern. Can you see that? So if I define two molecules sticking together like this, that's all I need to define. And then I build up my crystal by adding molecules like this in this direction, this direction, and this direction. So this little pattern here of my fingers becomes the unit cell. It's the smallest repeating pattern that I need to define in order to describe the molecule position in my crystal structure. If you did A-level chemistry, and I know you did A-level chemistry because it's a mandatory requirement for doing pharmacy, you probably talked about sodium chloride when you were looking at crystal structures. And sodium chloride is kind of handy for this sort of thing because it tends to split into a sodium and a chloride ion. And then you can put those ions at the corner of a cube and that's how you create your unit cell. So when you look at a sodium chloride crystal it's cubic um, because it's a, a cubic unit cell that's repeated in different directions. And so on the screen you can see the black circles in the corner of my cube. That's ideal when you're talking about positioning just ions or atoms. We're talking about crystalline structures of drugs and so if you remember the ibuprofen we looked at earlier, the ibuprofen molecule is a lot bigger than a single atom and therefore it's not really possible to put it directly on the corner of a of a cube like this but nonetheless what we would look at for a particular crystalline structure is what's the smallest repeating position of um, drug molecules it can be as few as two drug molecules in a pattern and then we try and draw a cube fit a cube or some sort of um, three-dimensional shape around that and that becomes our unit cell which then repeats in different um, dimensions. So what does this mean? It means you've got to get your head around the concept of a unit cell and you've got to understand that a unit cell is the smallest repeating pattern that builds up to make the crystalline structure. How do we define the unit cell? The easiest way is to think about the geometry. So on the screen you can see that to define a cube what I need to do is define the length, the width and the height and also the angles between the sides, alpha, beta and gamma. If it's a cube, then A equals B equals C and gamma, uh, alpha equals beta equals gamma. The three angles are uh, and equal 90 degrees for a cube. So if we define the lengths of the sides of our unit cell and the angles between them, um, we can basically describe any sort of three dimensional um, shape which encompasses the position of the molecules in our unit cell. Now, I always like to teach by analogy, and one of my favorite analogies is the Lego brick. So in this instance, I'm going to use the Lego brick as an analogy for a unit cell. Now, where I think this is a little bit tricky is you've got to remember that this shape, in this case, it's a rhomboid, isn't it, shape? It's the geometric shape which we're drawing, which is covering the molecules that are in our unit cell. So we may have two or three or four, whatever it is, molecules of ibuprofen. Uh, and this is the shape which covers those in space. 
And so it's our unit cell. But within this unit cell, then, there are a number of ibuprofen molecules that are arranged in a, in a pattern. When we then build our crystal, the unit cells combine. So we'd have another unit cell, then another unit cell, and then another unit cell, and so on. And so we're going to build up a crystal that we can see with, with trillions and trillions of molecules in. But essentially, we only need to describe one of the unit cells, which has got the repeating pattern of molecules in it, in order to be able to define the crystalline structure of our crystal. And the reason is because the pattern is the same throughout the crystal. One thing which is really important is that for one particular molecule, it's possible to have more than one unit cell. So what that means is, uh, if you think about my fingers again, maybe sucrose can align in a pattern like this, and that becomes one unit cell. So let's for argument's sake say that's the blue one. So it looks like this, doesn't it? Two fingers, looks like this. Let's for argument's sake say it's possible that they can combine in a different way. Maybe the molecules can fold up and so they combine like this instead. So maybe that's a slightly smaller unit cell. The pattern of molecules in the unit cell is different. So when we try and draw our three dimensional cube around where the molecules are, maybe we get a different shape. So let's for argument's sake say we end up with a different shape. So I've got a Lego brick of a different color. This is now the unit cell for a different arrangement of molecules. I'm going to come back to what this means a little bit later on. But imagine then that we build up our crystal structure by putting these unit cells together, we end up with a different crystal. So I want to be clear here that um, these are then different crystalline structures of the same molecules. So a bit like we talked about with sucrose, and we had sugar cubes and candy floss, that was crystalline anamorphous. It's also possible that the molecules can pack together in different crystalline structures, so different unit cells that then add together to make crystals. And the properties of these crystals are going to be different. So the properties of blue is going to be different from the properties of the green. Okay. I don't want to get bogged down too much in the mathematics of unit cells, but I think it's kind of important to recognise that we have to fit some sort of three-dimensional shape around the molecules that are in our unit cell in order to define them mathematically. And as I said already, we do that by defining the three uh, sides, the length of the three sides, and the angles between them. On the screen in front of you is a table with all the different permutations of unit cell shapes that you can have. You might be surprised to know that there are only seven, but that's the way that mathematics works. So if you look at the bottom of the table, you can see A equals B equals C, alpha equals beta equals gamma equals 90 degrees. That's cubic, that's the one that we talked about already. If we are considering um, some other shapes, one you might have heard of, uh, triclinic for instance, a does not equal B, does not equal C, alpha does not equal beta, does not equal gamma. So you, you might have heard of that. Uh, monoclinic as well, another one you might have heard of. Uh, A does not equal B, does not equal C, alpha equals gamma equals 90 degrees, but does not equal beta, and so on. You can go down the table and you'll see that there are only seven ways of arranging um, a unit cell. In practice, you really only need to worry about triclinic, monoclinic, or orthorhombic. Nearly all um, drugs that we consider have one of those three shapes of unit cell. Okay. Now a common question that people ask me, do I need to remember all this stuff for an exam, sir? Because there's a lot of stuff in this table and I'm panicking about revising. And the answer is absolutely not. I'm not going to ask a question about the stuff in this table. You don't need to remember that Triclinic has three sides that are not the same and three angles that are not the same. It's really not important. The table is here simply so that you can kind of get your head around how we start to describe crystal structures. I don't want you to get bogged down in the mathematics. OK. So that's good because it means we're at the end of part one. So if you are OK with um, unit cells, stop, have a cup of tea, come back and watch part two. If you're not clear about unit cells, repeat the last bit, watch again, maybe have a look at the textbook, maybe send me an email. Once you're comfortable that you understand what the concept of unit cells are, then when you come back, we'll start looking at crystal habit. 
So with that thought, I'll see you in a minute.